I'll represent a number of different groups on campus. So, okay, let's walk. We'll walk this way to the back of the Barrington Center for the Arts where, where there's an organic garden. But, but this garden has been their labor of love this summer. And I can say that when uh, I'm the advisor for this group and part of my job is to keep them from starting everything they could think of all at once. You know how that is. So when they first wanted to do this, it was going to be about three times as big. It was going to go all the way down, you know, around this whole crown of the hill. And I said, you know, I think it, your zeal will flag when you get in the middle of July and it's all volunteers and half of you are not here. So how about you make a significantly smaller area and get it to really work? And they did. And there's been these periodic emails from the driving forces. Matt Shetney and Madeline Skillen have been two of the students working on this, but there's been a huge group of students who write uh, about how the deer stalk them when they're in the garden. The deer are waiting until they leave. And all this has been quite an adventure. This is an organic garden and they actually it, and Lane sold vegetables that they grew. They're trying to raise money for their club. And so it's been very exciting. It has really added to Gordon has a, a long history of concern about sustainable agriculture, even though we're not a really agricultural college. And so a lot of um, uh, our students go down to Echo, for example, and a lot of people and you guys are nodding because you did those kinds of things. And uh, so we have a long history of interest in sustainable agriculture. Some of you know that there are a number of community supported agriculture farms in the region and not connected with Gordon, uh, but a number of Gordon faculty and staff belong to them. I, uh, there's a lot of interest in this, growing interest in where our food comes from and buying locally. And this is Actually, to me, I don't know, if you garden, this is looking fabulous. I, <laughs> if you're not gardening, you might think, wow, you know, the fences are shaky. But if you garden, it looks really good, and the tomatoes are coming in, and they had a whole range of things. So and we'll, we'll uh, talk again at the parking lot marsh. Gather around, and we'll try and get off of the roadway if we can. or as much as we can. Some of you will remember what this space looked like um, years ago. And would somebody like to just sort of summarize what this looked like before 2001? This is where the parking lot ended and the pond began. Right. This space, for those of you who don't know, and I wish I had a photo of it, because I do have some photos from that time, um, the parking lot was much lower than here. The fence was not here. None of this vegetation was here. The parking lot ran into the water. And you would see cars parked in spaces right by the water. And then if it was a very rainy day, people would park. <laughs> You're laughing because you know exactly what I'm going to say. People would park. The water would rise. They would come out to their car and there would be a stretch of water to somehow get through to get to the door because the car would be inundated. So they would slog through the water to get into their cars. It was not ideal. As a wetland ecologist, they didn't think it was great, but the, it's one of the delightful things was this was a place where the aesthetics and the ecology matched. That is, it looked terrible and ecologically wasn't ideal. And so uh, we managed, the campus managed to get a number of grants to, re, to do with this wetland restoration. Now, I love this story because when they, in 1951, the campus was purchased and Gordon moved here, one of the first things they did was pave this stretch. They, they paved toward the back here and built, Jenks was one of the first buildings built. Uh, it wasn't Jenks at the time, it was Wynn Library and was much smaller. But when they built this, there were 19 feet of peat, which is an indication that this had been a wetland for thousands of years. But apparently it was dry enough for them to be very hopeful people. And they put the <laughs> parking lot down thinking that somehow 
the paving would win. And you know, when you go up against water, you don't win. That's sort of the story of Gordon. If you try to go up against water, you really don't win. So what happened was immediately, the water started taking back its own. The parking lot sank. And so when we first came, several of these people were in classes with me. You would walk out, there would be parking lot under your feet, but it would look like a marsh. And you could step up on it and go like this. You, rem you remember this, yeah. You could go like this and it would go waga waga. Now I, it's a little iffier because the hydrology has changed with this. But then when they got the grant, what they did was actually remove all the blacktop, remove as much blacktop as they could into the water that could be reached from the edge. And then they raised the road about, about five feet, tilted it so that except in the most rainy days, water goes into storm sewers and the oils are removed before it goes into the parking lot. And so what we have is a uh, flow of water from back there near 120 along the back here and it flows then into the ponds. Very, very nice parcel of land that's now held in trust with two uh, conservation commissions and a couple of nonprofits. It's not really all Gordon land, but that's in conservancy. And how many of you remember, you would be walking and you'd see in the ditches uh, tennis balls. Do you, so, you remember this? And you would say, I remember thinking, how many tennis players are walking in the woods and losing their balls? Like, I, I do not get this. And I finally, you know, I had to have enough hydrology background to get, people were losing them up at the tennis court and they were flowing all the way down into the woods, uh, uh, you know, in this long journey to the sea, you know. <laughs> The other thing that's interesting is that when I was an undergrad, which was, of course, 20 years ago, there were alewife that came up. Alewife are fish that re-enter their natal stream and they would come up and they would actually cross. I don't believe that alewife currently come into any of the great ponds, though regionally there has been some effort to try to, um, to re-establish alewife breeding in areas where it used to occur. But at this point, I don't think that we have alewife, but they, they used to be. Okay, let's keep walking. This, um, this is where you would see sometimes tennis balls bobbing. There's a culvert under here that comes into Koi. Koi receives water this way, but it also does receive groundwater because it's spring fed. That's one of the reasons why it's quite dangerous to skate on. And so there's signs about no skating. Um, and then there's an exit farther up this way. So it's a long, Koi is about 23 acres of land and, I mean, of water, about eight of which are emergent vegetation and lily pads. Sometimes we will have people who have a montane lake sensibility who think you should dig up all the lilies. But from a system thinking perspective, it's it's not a very effective use of your money because the reason there are so many is it's shallow, fairly warm, and full of nutrients. So it would not take very long before all those conditions forced it. It's sort of like you can't win against water. You know, you have to have a good reason to remove a lot of the vegetation because that's what's going to happen again. It, it did uh, grow in more rapidly than maybe it would have from natural processes uh, because at the initial decades of the college being here, there, was, there were septic systems and there were just so many people that some of those nutrients got into the, wet, the wetlands and uh, obviously that can have an impact. What that does is speed up a natural process. And so um, it would naturally do this, but it did actually grow faster. Since subsequent to that, in the 1970s, Gordon is located in Wenham, but it, it uh, connected to the city of Beverly for sewer and water because we're right at the corner. And Beverly, uh, so we buy water and services from Beverly because we're so, such a high concentration of people right at the edge of Beverly. Yeah. <clears throat>
Uh, we'll just stop here for a second. A number of the alums remember having some kind of interaction with me where I, we stopped here and did a lab or something. Um, but there's a number of things to notice here. The strip that we came by had a lot of purple loose strife. Now we don't have it. Purple loose strife isn't very striking right now because all the brown, uh, because all the purple spikes are now brown. But we just passed a huge amount of purple loose strife, which is an invasive species from Eurasia. And over there is controlled by a number of herbivores that are not over here. Um, but there were also some native plants. If you were to turn around, that tall one that's brown and unprepossessing was purple two weeks ago. And that is Joe Pieweed. That's a, a native wetland plant. And we are on this side, you can see some dead. Welcome to identification of dead plants. <laughs> this dead flower here was bright yellow, it was Biden's. Uh, it would be like this whole mass right here. Um, was, uh, was yellow and very striking looking. And then in here we have some shrubs that are native and some um, that are not, some glossy buckthorn that's coming in. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is figure out how to, with the resources we have, get some invasive species removal. You watch this too, but the bigger the path gets, uh, the more open it is to invasion by, nat by non-natives. I'll talk some more about this when we get to the native plant garden. But in Massachusetts, there is about 900 native plants and almost the same number of introduced plants, many of which are quite aggressive. And so, um, so when you do anything like widen a path now, it's a completely different process ecologically than it would have been even 20 or 30 years ago because the pressure of the plants to come in is largely non-native. And that has led to the loss of many native species in Massachusetts and some other changes. Obviously, um, plants are not the only non-natives we have. And let's look up at this. This is uh, a hemlock beech forest. The reason that you might expect to see something like this in the upland and a completely different thing down here, which is shrubs with birch and um, red maple, is that these trees cannot handle having their roots as wet. And so they're on the upland, and you can see that they make a very dark canopy. Hemlock is one of the only trees regionally that can germinate under such dark conditions. So if you have that level of canopy, you can get baby hemlocks, but nothing else could root. And you'd have to have some kind of fire or some kind of wind throw or something to open up an area for anything else to come in. Uh, and then we have a lot of beech trees but one of the things that's been coming into the area is the hemlock woolly adelgid. As we pass, we'll see some infected hemlock trees. It's a sap-sucking insect pest that will kill hemlocks. You can individually treat trees, though it's very difficult to do. And the, the unfortunate side of having so many wetlands is it's illegal for us to use some of the treatments that would involve be put into the soil because most of the treatments do involve some kind of injection at the root because of the wetlands. And so what that means is that we are left with spot treating a few trees. But honestly, in the next several decades, this forest is going to change tremendously because we are going to lose a lot of hemlocks. Unfortunately, uh, Wenham and Beverly are just being hit by something called the beech scale. It's a related insect that also looks like a fluffy cotton ball uh, that lives on and sa sucks sap. Both of those can directly kill trees and they can carry viruses that could kill trees as well. And so we are expecting some fairly significant changes in regional forest. If you're interested in forests in New England, I just this summer read the book, Reading the Forested Landscape by Tom Wessels. And that's a fabulous book, I, so if you're interested in anything like that. We'll keep walking this way and we'll look at, we'll see some other um, native plants, invasive species, and a couple other things to talk about as we go, yeah. How are the invasive ones getting in? 
Um, many, in, for woody plants, 80% of the invasive species we have have come escaped from horticulture. And so if, you're, if you are interested, please be interested. <laughs> if you are interested, I'm a member of the New England Wildflower Society, and they have a lot of literature on protecting native species and because plant diversity is collapsing because of this. But, so, but there are now, there's a, a whole New England group of people in a group called IPAIN that pay attention in invasive species and that uh, they've identified, and, and there are now state laws. And so there's a number of plants that it's, it's going to become illegal to propagate in two, 2009 and it's, or some that are currently illegal to propagate. And I find that most people don't even know that, you know. And so, well, what happens, for example, glossy buckthorn is one. You see it here, it ha produces a lot of berries, birds spread it. But if you can picture, and I don't mean to just lecture you guys, tell me to shut up if, if you know this or aren't interested, but um, one paper, like I just read a couple years ago, described how many birds put their nests in bushes with thorns. And there's some bushes that are native with thorns, like holly or whatever, where a bird might put its nest in, it would be protected from predators. But some of the invasive species come out sooner. So the birds build their nests there when they're flowering in the spring, but they don't get as much protection from predators. So you can picture that there's like all kinds of ripple effects from it's not just native plants. It has this huge impact. Just like the bringing in of one insect, those are accidental introductions. And there's many marine and lake ones that are like, um, yeah, uh, tobacco has kabamba weed, which is, I don't know the scientific name for that, but if you get the letters from the Tobacco Lake Association, which I get, and some of you probably do too, um, you know, it got put in by a boater accidentally, coming in as some kind of debris on a boat. So a purple loosestrife was imported for gardens and then has escaped. If you were to map purple loosestrife, it would look like a map of roadways because it's very, and because they like ditches. They're, they like water, they like ditches, it, and it would just look like a map of roads. Yeah. So I don't mean, actually, this is not intended to be a negative, scared you <laughs> conversation. So let's go look at some more beautiful things. Well, do you know, all around the world, there's people that have imported plants from us. Yes. And other things, like the skunk is an invasive, unfortunate in Europe. And some, yes, we don't think of that. We think, oh my gosh. But oh, all over the world, people go, I saw this thing in America. It was so cool. Let me put it in my garden. And then they have the same problems that 